Hello and welcome to this film which is all about calorimetry calculations. It's the fifth in a series of films about the standard level energetics topic and whereas in the last film we were really looking at how we might carry out experiments to measure heat changes, here we're going to use that formula that we introduced in the last film to calculate heat changes and furthermore to calculate molar enthalpy changes for a reaction. And then last of all, we're going to look at some of the assumptions or errors that might be made in the experiment to try and account for any differences between our calculated value and an experimental value. OK, we'll start with a quick reminder of a formula that you don't have to remember because it's printed in the data booklet, but you do have to know how to use it. So if you're asked to find a heat change, that's Q, Okay, you take the mass of the substance you're heated, you've heated, you've multiplied it, you multiply it by the specific heat capacity of that substance and the temperature change that you observed in that substance. And remember that we can then later on say that the enthalpy change is going to be related to that heat change because we'll assume that all the enthalpy that changed was changed into heat. Okay, so here's an example of a combustion reaction that we might get a question about. We're being told that 150 centimeters cubed of water were placed in the can here in this calorimetry experiment. And we've noted the temperature at the start, 23 degrees centigrade. We've burned ethanol in this burner down here. And we've noted that the mass of the burner was this at the start, 101.8 grams, and at the end, 100.9 grams. And the temperature of the water had risen to 43 degrees centigrade. And we're being asked to calculate the heat release, which remember is Q. Okay, so what is our M? Now I've deliberately given this question because we've got a number of different masses in the question. And the mass that we're actually looking for isn't given as a mass, it's kind of given as a volume, if you like, right? Because we know that it's the water that is being heated. We want the mass of the substance that's being heated here, not the substance that's heating it. One centimeter cubed of water weighs one gram, so the mass is 150 grams. What is C? Well, C is given in the data booklet. It's 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. Why are we using that? Because we're heating water, and that's the specific heat capacity of water. What's the temperature change in Kelvin? Well, that's 20 Kelvin. Okay, and if I multiply those three together, I find Q, and that is 1,000. Uh, sorry, 12,540 joules. But remember, I've only got two significant figures here, so I'm going to give my answer to two significant figures, and I'm also going to turn it into kilojoules, which I don't have to do, but I'm doing. Okay, so 13 kilojoules is my heat change. Okay, so that's, I suppose, quite a simple question along the lines of the one that we saw in the last film. Notice here there's a red herring. The two minutes is completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter because time doesn't appear in this formula. But let's go ahead and look at a slightly more complex calculation where we try and find the molar enthalpy of combustion of ethanol. So this is the enthalpy change when you combust one mole of ethanol. And to be able to do this problem, we're going to need to know the formula of ethanol, which is C2H5OH. OK, now we already know that the heat change was 13 kilojoules. OK, we calculated that in the previous question. How do we know that we have to do that here? Well, we're trying to find an enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole. So we're going to need to know what the heat change was. And then we're going to have to see how many kilojoules would have been released if we'd had one mole of ethanol, right? because this tells us how many kilojoules are released for every mole of ethanol. Okay, So we're going to need to know how many moles of ethanol we've got. So we're going to need to know the mass of ethanol, because remember the number of moles is equal to the mass over the molar mass. And in this case, this equals 0.9 grams. We've only got one significant figure there. Divided by the molar mass, which we could add up, the atomic mass is there and we get 46.08. If I've only got one significant figure here, even though I've got four in my data book value here, then this equals 0 0.02 moles to one significant figure. Okay, so I now know the number of moles of ethanol. I know the heat change for this number of moles of ethanol. Now, if I told you that you had two moles of ethanol and asked you how many kilojoules you'd release 
for every mole of ethanol, well, you divide that by two. You take this heat change and you divide it by the number of moles. Okay, so quite often, if you're not sure what to do next, you can figure it out by putting a nice simple number in here. Another really good way of doing it is to look at the units that you're using. Kilojoules per mole, in other words, kilojoules divided by moles. So remember, the units are often helpful in helping you decide what to do next. So I'm going to take my 13 kilojoules, I'm going to divide it by 0 0.02 moles, check here, kilojoules per mole, so I'm going to get an answer with the right units, and if I do this, I find that to one significant figure again, I get 700 kilojoules per mole. Now, does this answer make sense? This is clearly an exothermic reaction, but I've ended up with a positive value for the enthalpy of combustion, so I just put a negative in here, because I know that the value has to be negative. If you're wondering, how can you just change a number to a negative? Remember, we're talking about an enthalpy change now. So if the heat row, if the heat supplied to the water was 700 kilojoules, that means that the enthalpy of the ethanol must have fallen by 700 kilojoules, hence the negative sign there. And the final thing we've got to do here is to talk about any assumptions or errors that might have taken place. We've just found a value of seven, minus 700 kilojoules per mole, remember? Okay, and we're being told that the data book value, so the one that we believe to be correct, is that uh, is minus 1,371 kilojoules per mole. Now, there's a massive difference between those two, okay? But bear in mind, we've got an extremely inaccurate setup, right? We've assumed that all the heat that is released by the ethanol burning makes it into the water. Right? We've assumed that the enthalpy change in the ethanol is the same as the heat change, which is fair enough, um, well, except that we've given off some light as well. Right? So we've, um, but that's going to be a small error. We've assumed that all this enthalpy change is going to turn into a heat change, and all that heat is going to make it into the water, but we're heating the air around it. Right? We're heating the can, so the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter is not going to be exactly the same as the water. And this calorimeter is going to be losing heat all the time, right? So there's going to we, we would expect a fairly large difference in these two values because of the fact that there's a large amount of error in this experiment. And the assumptions that we've made about all the heat making it to the water simply can't be right. Okay, so what we were trying to do in this film was to try and calculate heat changes using the formula that we'd seen in the last film. Um, we have turned that heat change into a molar enthalpy change by uh, figuring out how many moles of the substance um, were reacted, and then figuring out how many kilojoules or joules of heat would have been produced for every mole of that substance. And then we finally looked at ways in which we might account for differences between our calculated value and the experimental value um, from the data book, that is, um, by talking about the errors in our experiments. If you've got any questions or comments, um, please feel free to come and see me or to post a comment on YouTube.